following is a conversation between Angela McArdle and Mark Pomar on US foreign policy. Angela is an American politician from Texas and California. She is the chair of the Libertarian National Committee, which manages the Libertarian Party. Angela has worked in litigation for over 12 years, focusing on property rights, constitutional law, and business litigation. Mark is a senior national security fellow at the Clement Center here at the University of Texas, Austin. He was previously the assistant director of the Russian service at Radio Free Europe, director of the USSR division at The Voice of America, um, executive director of the Board for International Broadcasting, and most recently Mark published a book about international broadcasting called Cold War Radio. Um, so thank you for coming on this podcast. Um, I want to start um, discussing our positions on war in general. So Angela, uh, what is the libertarian stance on war? What values should guide US foreign policy? We're pretty strict non-interventionists, which means that we do not believe that the United States military should intervene in wars abroad, and we do not believe that the United States military should should engage in aggressive uh, militaristic acts outside of the country as well. Does that make sense? Like, it's pretty much no war. We're a very, very vocal. Just in case of national defense. Yep, strictly national defense. We're, we're the anti-war party. Makes sense. How about you, Mark? Well, I don't represent any political party, so I don't have any official view mm -hmm. to, uh, to enunciate uh, at all. I think that my experience as a historian is that whether people like it or not, unfortunately, wars occur, wars take place, the world is very dangerous. And I think more important to keep in mind, the world is very interconnected. And so what may seem to some people a distant conflict, in actual fact, may have serious repercussions for American national defense or for the defense of, of the West. Uh, I think in a very basic sense, we, our prosperity, our way of life, our uh, high standard of living is because there has been a well-functioning uh, liberal world order post-World post War II and that has uh, lulled us into thinking that uh, everything is going to be just fine. I think there are dangers on the horizon, and I think those dangers are worth um, exploring. Whether or not that involves going to war is a very different matter. I'm not advocating that we should be going into war either, but I think that the national security of the United States and the West broadly, because we are part of it, we are not an island unto ourselves, mm -hmm. Uh, I think is something that needs to be taken into account as conflict arises in different parts of the world. You mentioned dangers to national security. So let's talk about the conflict in Ukraine. Why did Putin attack Ukraine? The official communication coming from the US government is that Putin has this imperialist ambition to rebuild the Russian Empire. He wants to reinstate the Soviet Union. And that's why he attacked. Some people say that's not true, that the US government is misleading us. And the real reason is that we provoked him by trying to expand NATO, which was never meant to happen because we had an agreement, I believe, from the 90s that uh, said that the West would not expand NATO beyond what it was at that point. Um, so wh why did he attack? Wh what do you think is the real reason? Well, there are many reasons. There's not any one reason. Uh, I've had a lifetime of dealing with the Soviet Union and Russia beginning in 1973, my first visit to the Soviet Union, and uh, ending in 2016 after eight years as president of the U.S.-Russia Foundation based mm -hmm. in Moscow. So that part of the world is very familiar to me. I, I know it quite well, and I think that one should look at reasons rather than one reason. Yeah. Uh, and I think it is a combination of factors, uh, including what I think is very tragically, tragically for Russia, a kind of political suicide, because the war is uh, one that is waged mercilessly. It's a, waged against a country that did not prompt that war. Uh, I happen to have many friends, and I know Ukraine very well. I've been there many, many times, and I am grieving over what many of my friends are experiencing. It's, it's a tragic and horrible situation. And I think it also um, 
can disrupt and is disrupting uh, the world order that we have created. I think that Ukraine deserves, as any post-colonial state, I mean, Russia, you have to think of Russia as the last great big European empire. And a lot of that empire fell apart in 1989, 1991, as Central and Eastern Europe gained their independence, as the Soviet republics fell apart. And in the process of the last 30 years, there has been a growth of independent nations, whether they're the Baltic states or Georgia or Ukraine or any number of other former republics. And I think that there is certainly a strong dose of reintegrating to some extent that empire. Do you think this would have happened under Trump, if Trump was president? You know, I, I find it personally rather abhorrent to talk about Trump in general. So I, I really have very, very little to say about, about Trump other than uh, I, as a very patriotic American and as someone who worked in the U.S. government at one point, I mm -hmm. found that his press conference with uh, Putin is, was one of the most embarrassing moments to me as an American when he said he would take the word of, a, of Mr. Putin over the word of his own, um, of his own intelligence services. To me, that was a, an insult to me and it was an insult to, to America in general. And he even said recently in a CNN interview, uh, he was asked, would, would you like Ukraine to win or something like that? Who, who, would, who would you want to win? And he said, I just don't want people to keep dying. He didn't say specifically that he wants Ukraine to win the war. Um, what, what do you think about that, Angela? I think that's a perfectly reasonable response coming from someone who really shouldn't have any business being involved in another country's affairs. I would also like for people to stop mm -hmm. dying in wars abroad. But I'm not putting my thumb on the scale. And do you think Putin attacked because of the U.S. provocation? I mean, none of us know. Everybody has our theories. We all have theories. None of us really know his private thoughts. Mm -hmm. And I think that sometimes we rush to really articulate what we think he's doing. We, to be clear, like we can't really know for sure. I think that. I think that Putin and his regime the people that he surrounds himself with view the encroachment of NATO and the United States involvement in Ukrainian government affairs as an existential threat to their country. And that is really tragic. And I think that they have largely attacked because of that. There, there was the Maidan revolution. There was the United States meddling in that. You can't say for certain that that uprising would not have taken place without the United States putting, putting its thumb on the scale, but it definitely did happen. We did meddle with their affairs. You got all kinds of hideous comments from Victoria Newland on the record. It's really unfortunate. And I think that that played a significant role in it. And I think it might have also played a significant role in the extent of it and our ability um, to sort of negotiate things down because of that, if that makes sense. I would offer a very different point of view. I, um, I know Ukraine, I know it well. I think it's a country that desperately wants to be in the West, desperately wants, it's willing to die to be in the West. It's willing to die to be a Western democracy. When you mention and Ukraine, do you mean the government? Do you mean the people? The nation, the, the civil society of okay. Ukraine, which is vibrant, exciting, interesting. I know them, I've been there. I ran programs, educational programs in Ukraine. The reason why so many people that you see interviewed in Ukraine speak such good English is because they are desperately, as the Baltic states and many other former colonies, this is a colonizing or decolonizing war. This is a nation breaking out of an evil empire. And I very, very much stress that the Soviet Union and the Russian state today is an evil regime. I lived there. I lived there for eight years, from 2008 to 2016. Every day I lived in Moscow. I traveled throughout the country. I know these people. I know they're wonderful people in Russia. There are plenty of good friends and I still keep up with them. But the regime as a basis is an evil, evil regime. Heartless, corrupt, uh, and I think that what they are doing is, is, is uh, a tragedy of the highest 
degree, and we haven't seen this kind of destruction of non-military targets, the destruction of people's homes, bombing maternity wards, bombing uh, hospitals. This is, this is war crimes par excellence, and I really hope that The Hague collecting information will make a strong, strong case for Putin as a war criminal and for the Russian government, today's government, an absolute um, evil regime. I mean, they are bringing prisoners and giving them amnesty to go out and kill. I mean, this is something that no country that I'm aware of has ever done would ever do. And so I think there is a moral issue at play here. Well, looking at it from the outside perspective, you obviously have uh, you know, a negative viewpoint towards the Russian government, but a lot of people in the rural parts of Russia support Putin. Well, I think he has majority support I, in, in the rural unfor- regions. Unfortunately, I feel for my profession, I have to watch and listen to Russian media, which I do in small doses, but I do, and I listen to it in, in the Russian language, mm-hmm. not in translation. And when you, when a government controls every single form of media in a country, something that no American can comprehend because we never have had anything like that, no European country except for, you know, obviously Nazi Germany has Mm -hmm. had a total dominance of every single form, whether it's a podcast, whether it is a radio station, whether it's a TV station, you have one and only one line of information. So yes, if you are spewing uh, your propaganda with no other voice possible, of course you will persuade a certain percentage of people that this is indeed a reality. Uh, But the very fact that millions of people have fled Russia Millions have fled, yeah. including people here in Austin that I run into who have one way or another fled from, from Russia, already tells you that this is a very, very uh, strange situation where, where people have voted with their feet, in a sense. Mm-hmm. Is there any counter-revolutions, any revolts in Russia that could you know, change the domestic politics there? Anything is possible. I mean, we, we may wake up tomorrow and see that there's been a coup, but, but at the present, I'm not aware of any. There's, it's a security state. It's a, it's a very strong, you know, I was giving a lecture at UT a few weeks ago, and so I looked up some, some statistics, and, and it's astounding the percentage of people working in security services in, in Russia, the high percentage given its population, which, of course, means that it's a fortified state, and a fortified state is very hard to bring down from inside. So you're saying the majority of Russians are tired of the war, they want it to end? We don't know what. You can't do any surveys. You, people will not yeah. speak. If you say the wrong word, if you call the war in Ukraine a war and not a special operation, <laughs> you can be very well jailed. And people are being jailed. Movie actors and theaters are being closed because they didn't say the right word or they didn't say the right thing. So you are living in a state that is under severe repression. In that kind of state, you can't possibly do a survey. You can't possibly ask people because they're scared and they won't tell you anything beyond what they think will, will, you know, will make them safe. Yeah. I mean, as you said, Putin sold this as a limited special military operation. And his original plan was, uh, I think, four to six weeks. No, he, three or four days. Three or four yeah. days. Three or four days he would be in Kiev, and that would yeah. be the end of it. And, and, and He would assassinate and, you know, uh, Zelensky, and that would be the that end. Would be, that would be the end. That didn't happen. It didn't happen. And so, it's not happening, and if anything, it's, it's going the other direction. So. so they've suffered extreme losses in terms of men, in terms of material. What is their strategy now, Angela? What, what do you I, think? Well, I don't know what Vladimir Putin's strategy is. I think initially he just wanted to take the Donbas region and the areas where Ukrainians had support for the Russian government. There are people, that, for whatever reason, in Ukraine who feel more closely allied mm-hmm. with, with Russia. You know, there, there are ethnic Russians there. There are people who have ties there. So I, get, I get it. You know, it's not my jam. I'm, I'm not wishing to be over in Russia right now. But it's also not my business. And, you know, when that didn't happen, 
I'd, I'd point back to the comments I made about him viewing this as an existential threat. I don't think losing is an option for him, which is... Um, what, would, what is losing for him, though? Right. What does it look like? What does that look like? I think for him, that would be seeding and, and you know, surrendering or reversing and going back and saying, never mind, you know, failed experiment. We'll just go back and do our own thing. He's got to have something. Yeah. I would love to see peace negotiations come forward, you know, to the extent the United States is involved in anything. I would like us to be negotiators of, of peace and to be open to what that might look like and that it not just be absolute unconditional surrender for Vladimir Putin, because who are we to say that that's the best decision for the people in that conflict zone? That's true. Russia announced recently that it's suspending the participation in the single remaining nuclear pact. What is the likelihood of a nuclear war? And how should we react? Was he to use that option of last resort? I'd like to think that it's not likely, but I think we should proceed with caution as though it is. I think that would be the the wise choice. Mm -hmm. I don't want to live in a world of nuclear fallout. I don't, I don't want to try you know, to navigate nuclear winter or to be worrying about other people taking, you know, pushing their red button because once one drops, who's to say that there aren't tons that will drop. It completely changes the, the international political landscape. Uh, Michael, who is the chair of the house foreign affairs committee said that there's going to be a counter offensive very soon in the next few months which could lead to ceasefire and negotiations. What are your thoughts about that? Do you think it's a good idea to do this counteroffensive? Uh, do you think that it could lead to negotiations? Or do you think that diplomacy is completely dead and there's no chance this could be the end? I don't ever want to see... I don't believe in increasing military firepower as a, a path towards negotiation. I think de-escalation is the way and, and diplomacy and diplomacy is challenging and, and I acknowledge that and it's very tough work and you have to put people in who are committed and willing to do it. How, how would you do diplomacy at this point? I think we have to start by listening to his demands, seeing things from his perspective and even if we don't agree with, with a single bit of it, we have to try to find a way to persuade him that you know this is not an existential threat, NATO isn't there to dismantle Russia to take him apart. No one's coming to assassinate him. Mm -hmm. Um, And that does, you know, maybe that means or doesn't mean that we give him, quote unquote, what he wants. But we've got to find a way to communicate to him, you know, that we're not out for his throat. Uh, I think that would probably be a good place to start. So do you think that Finland and Sweden should not be joining NATO? Oh, I absolutely oppose NATO and think the whole thing should be um, dismantled and abolished. I want to pull out of it. Oh. I don't, the, Uni- the United States pays for way too much of it. But at the minimum, right, so if I, someone was going to negotiate with me and I'm the holdout saying, mm-hmm. no, dis- disband it, get rid of it, I think they should start by negotiating with me by at least saying we're not going to grow it more. Mark, what is your opinion? Well, there's so many issues to, to address. Um, which would you like me to look at? First? NATO. NATO, I'm a strong supporter of NATO. I think it's been a very successful alliance. Uh, I think it's kept the peace. It's uh, provided the basis for a very prosperous Western world. Um, and I think that there was a concerted effort, a very serious effort to integrate Russia into it. There was a NATO office in Moscow until very recently. There was a Russian presence in NATO headquarters in Brussels. There was total coordination of all military exercises on both sides until recently. And that for 30 years, uh, it was a cooperative. And it was not an issue for the most part uh, going forward. I think what's missed in, in the argument about NATO is that there are legitimate countries that were part of the Soviet empire, that know it, fear it, have had a horrible history being under the thumb of the Soviet Union or Russia prior to the Soviet Mm -hmm. Union. Poland comes to mind, the Baltic states are another one, Czech Republic. Um, These are countries, Finland that was attacked by Stalin in 1939. These are countries that have been Uh, have had a very, very tragic experience with Russian domination. So that 
the impetus for NATO did not come from the U.S. or did not come from France and the U.K., which actually in many ways opposed the, 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 the expansion of NATO. It came from within Poland and other former Soviet colonies that saw that as a way of protecting their independence and very historically justified over, over hundreds of years of being um, not just dominated, but Poland ceased to exist after Russia, Prussia, and Austria carved it up at the end of the 18th century. So you've got, you've got deep historical um, grievances, to put it mildly. So I think the issue of NATO is, is much broader than just a military alliance. You know, uh, years ago, in late 1990s, I ran a pro project uh, funded by U.S. Agency for International Development uh, for development of free media in mm -hmm. Eastern Europe, primarily the Balkans. And I spent quite a bit of time in Bulgaria, and I remember asking Bulgarians, you know, why they wanted to join NATO. And their answer was a very curious one. They wanted better medical facilities. And I said, what do you mean better medical facilities? Well, they said, if you're part of NATO, you are required to have hospitals of a certain level to do certain level of operations. We have horrible rural hospitals, but if we join NATO, we will have better roads and better hospitals. That answer totally floored me. I never in my life would have expected that as an answer, but what they were saying was that it was a step to be part of Europe that to be part of the EU, to be part of NATO, was to be integrated into probably the most successful experiment in international relations that I can think of as a historian, which is the EU, which I think is really an amazingly successful integration of formerly antagonistic states into a thriving, evolving, uh, set of countries. I think it's been a highly successful one, and I can see where if you're sitting in Romania or you're sitting in Bulgaria, you're looking at the EU and saying, this is what I want. And Ukraine is no different. Ukraine wants that EU membership more than anything. And it's the rejection uh, of, or the rejection of the right to join the EU that really is at the uh, Con uh, that is the conflict between Ukraine and Russia. It's really the desire overwhelmingly in votes, overwhelmingly in elections, which Ukraine has and Russia does not, uh, joining the EU. And I think many people have suggested that NATO is probably not in Ukraine's future, but EU would make a lot of sense. And EU would help them integrate, would help them be peaceful, would bring them into greater prosperity. The problem is they don't uh, fulfill the requirements for EU membership. No, they don't at this point. There's a war going on. So at this point, nothing is going to happen. But the idea being that if the war is successfully completed, even if they lose parts of their territory, yeah. which most likely they will lose, being a realist, one has to sort of say, yes, for diplomacy's sake, you probably will end up having to have some kind yeah. of deal. Uh, the solution I have heard from people who are far more knowledgeable than I am uh, is the idea of a, what they call the Korean solution, which is an armistice, not really a peace, but an armistice that holds, that keeps people you know, in a non-war-like situation and allows the different parts of a former country to develop their own way. Probably, if I were pushed to the wall and say, what do I think is going to be the likely scenario? That's probably the scenario that I would most likely propose, that it'll be a demilitarized zone someplace drawn across eastern Ukraine, and mm -hmm. then the two entities will, will function separately. I think that that solution was proposed by Stephen Kotkin as well, who was an expert on the Soviet Union. He said that there's no way that Ukraine can regain its territory. They have to give up the eastern parts. There's no way they could get even Crimea, which is a complete red zone for you know Russia. Mm -hmm. And they and in return, they would get EU accession and security uh, guarantee. Yeah. Do you think, Angela, that's a, that's a good way to think about ending the war? I think it's better than nothing. I think it's yeah. just like a so much better outcome than having people to continue to die and yeah. conscription on both sides. Is, 
you know, I have a lot of compassion for the Ukrainian people who I feel are just stuck in this miserable fight and certainly can understand there are people who live there who are like, well, I don't want to live under Russian government. They think their neighbors are nuts for wanting to live under Vladimir Putin's rule. Um, yeah. So let's, I think, a de, I think a demilitarization zone and allowing people to leave would be really good. I don't think anybody. Leave, should, uh, I don't think anybody should be forced okay. to stay in Crimea if they want to. If they want mm-hmm. to get out, I think that's really critical to maintaining peace. If Ukraine has to cede any territory, people who don't want to live under Russian rule need to go. And and you know, like I would also remind people, you know, the Soviet Union's been gone for thirty years. As a libertarian, like I have such an incredible amount of contempt for communism. I struggle to yeah. articulate it. I think it's just, you know, lowball estimate, 50 million people dead on the, across the globe. The, the black book of communism puts it more at 100 million. We'll never know, right? But I, I know that going in and waging war on these countries just increases the death toll. I would like... I would like for the United States to also take in um, political refugees from people who want to escape um, communist I think countries. They have been doing that mm-hmm. now from Ukraine, it's not not from communist countries, but from Ukraine. And 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 people who are trying to dodge the draft in Russia. I'd love us to take take those people too, and and to also kind of reflect on our own draft policy, which is technically still in effect. By is the it? way, yes, we we are not using the draft, but at any moment. Yeah. Men, young men could be drafted to war in the United States, so we should learn from this. I don't think the average person knows that. The average man knows Go that. Go to the post office and you can see there are reminders in the U.S. post office for young men yeah. to sign up. It's They have to do it. Sign up for the draft. Hopefully no one does. Please don't. This is my, mm-hmm. this is my uh, illegal recommendation <laughs> that you do not <laughs> sign up for the draft. I have a 24-year-old son who's not signed up for any drafts. Very nice. I think most people would have to be forced. Yes. And I'm generally against anything that involves coercion and force. Me too. So what is your biggest argument for dismantling NATO? And what would you replace it with? What would the security situation look like in Europe, in the US? Sure, I would replace it with nothing. The Soviet Union has been gone for 30 years. You still have the UN. You still have the EU. Not a big fan of either of those, but if mm-hmm. we got to take it apart piece by piece, so if I'm saying abolish it all, right, and you're trying to you're trying to negotiate yeah. with me, yeah. you could say, all right, Angela, we're just going to get rid of one. How about NATO? Since we've already got the other two, and I would I would grumble and I would say, fine, mm-hmm. you know, I think that you already have a lot of international organizations keeping people in check, a lot of agreements, a lot of treaties. People do or don't follow them. Yeah, it just that's that's how it is you know and and i don't feel um i don't feel that nato is doing anything for me i think it's also a huge uh um financial burden for the united states as well i'd like to i'd like to get out of that i think the us is contributing something like over 80% of nato budget mm. right? i don't know if it's quite that high but it's very high it's very high it's very high i think percentage wise estonia is contributing more Given, given their 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 uh, well, not in absolute dollars, but in percentage. Um, to their GDP, yeah. Okay, right. Yeah. Um, See, so I hate communism, to... <laughs> and here I feel like we're ge- we're giving each according to their ability, according to their need, and I'm like, I, I want out. I want out. I object. But you want peace. You want security. And you think it could be achieved without us being in yeah, an official I mean, contractual agreement? The big elephant countries. in the room is, you know, American militarism and empire stretching across the globe. Like, who are we to go around telling people how to maintain peace when our military is bombing yeah. children in Afghanistan? It's embarrassing. But then if we didn't have the U.S., I don't think Russia would... You know, the, the the war in Ukraine would would be over, and and Russia would have taken Ukraine and the perhaps, whole thing, or maybe just part. I, it's I hard to know. say, right? It's hard to say, but I I believe if they did succeed to take Ukraine, they wouldn't stop there. They would go further. Are you further. sure? I See, think. we're we're in such speculative territory. <laughs> we are. It's really hard to but say. But would you risk it? 
Yeah, to, to get rid of NATO, I would. You would? I would, because we're not the only country in the world with a military. Mark, what is your opinion? Totally disagree. <laughs> Absolutely, categorically, 100% disagree. Um, and I disagree for a whole host of reasons, primarily because I think the world order, economic order in particular, depends on the U.S. No U.S., there would be no trade, there would be no safe passage, there would be no tr uh, ships going from country to country, there would be all kinds of pirates on the horizon. We maintain, we are the policemen of the world, and I think we've done overall a, a very good job doing it, and I think that that is something that can be done better, can be done smartly. I'm not saying every decision is great. I'm not saying that every uh, the Iraq war, I think, was a great mistake. I think mistakes have been made of a, of a monumental proportion. I would never, ever uh, deny that. Uh, and I think we should be smarter and, and about how we do it. But I think that the overall role, I'm a very, very proud um, former U.S. government employee. I think that uh, I take, uh, I think we do a lot of things that are very good. I think we handled probably one of the great moments in, in, in American politics was the way we handled the end of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War. We helped. We came in. We gave Russia my, uh, food. Do you know to this day, to this day, Russians, older Russians, still remember Bush's chicken legs because we supplied when Soviet Union at the end of 1990, 91, and I was there a lot during that time. It's basically on starvation basis. What did the U.S. do? The U.S. sent food. The U.S. sent aid. The U.S. sent. I mean, we've done a tremendous amount of good. And I think that is very, very often forgotten and uh, discounted. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think to, that's something that I, I find rather reprehensible that Americans don't know it because I think there are a lot of very fine chapters in our history in terms of, of what we did overseas. And I also say that there's no such thing. I'm gonna just give you one example. You are using in all of your equipment chips computer chips. True. Those computer chips are not made in the United States. Mm -hmm. Those computer chips are there only, only because we are pro pro uh, protecting Taiwan and only because certain machinery is done in the Netherlands and only because other parts are made in Japan and on and on. We did not have that. You would not have a single phone. You would not have a single computer. There's a very fine book written recently by Ch uh, Chris Miller called Chips. Uh, and yes, we're trying to bring some of that here, but it's not the most advanced chips. Yes, we're going to be building. And who's building those factories? Samsung and Taiwan, mm -hmm. which is the heart of the chip uh, industry for the world. So protecting Taiwan is more important for our standard of living than anything we do in the United States. And that we can only protect Taiwan through a combination of military and diplomatic use. That is so fundamental. And the idea and the notion, which I think is deeply erroneous, that somehow the United States is an island unto itself, is just simply not true. When it comes to um, you know, ending the war and the US support for Ukraine, I watched a few interviews with Lincoln uh, last night. And he's one of those people that can talk for an hour without saying anything. Um, and uh, so he's refusing to answer, how do we end the war? What's, what's next? What's our strategy? Uh, and the US so far has provided 113 billion, as of March, in military and humanitarian assistance um, since Russia invaded in February 2021. And Blinken said that they're determined to sustain the support um, as are our allies. Mark, do you think that we should sustain the support? We should force Europe to contribute more? I think France has recently committed to increased contribution. My sense is you're, it depends on what country. I think Poland is doing a phenomenal job supporting Ukraine. Mm -hmm. I think the Baltic states are doing an incredible job. And I may say that I personally send money to Ukraine to support them. So I am, I'm, that's my own personal money, obviously. Uh, so I, uh, I take it as, as a very strong moral issue as well. There is, and, and I think it's our moral duty to support Ukraine. Uh, and, and I feel very strongly of that. Um, 
of course it would be good to bring the war to an end. And I think that there is, it's sort of, having worked in the government, I can tell you, it's, you know, there's certain things, that especially if you get into negotiations, you're not going to be saying them in a, in a public forum. There are certain things that have to be back and forth behind closed doors. It's just the nature of diplomacy. So I, I don't think that any Secretary of State or any U.S. government official can sit down with any journalist and simply say, well, this is what we discussed. And I mean, it's bad enough right. that enough things get leaked, but you, you have to keep a certain level of, of confidentiality because things are contingent. And they're, once you say them, they no longer are contingent. They become some kind of reality that takes over. So I, I think that we are unrealistic in expecting either Secretary, Secretary Blinken or any other official to, to be laying out uh, exactly what they are mm -hmm. discussing behind closed doors. Mm -hmm. Angela, Matt Gaetz, which is a Republican in Florida, introduced a Ukraine fatigue resolution in February, yep. which was signed by 11 other lawmakers, lawmakers that called on the Biden administration to end all military and financial assistance to Ukraine and urged all sides to reach a peace agreement. Yep. Do you support this resolution? I did. We had a big rally in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. to support it. We had 3,000 mm -hmm. people at the Lincoln Memorial. I absolutely supported it. I really appreciate that Matt Gates did that, and it's been fascinating and weird to watch the Republicans shift to become a little bit more of a mainstream anti-war uh, party mm -hmm. than... Than the Democrats, of course, they don't feel that way about China, you know. But they they do that with with yeah. they do that with Ukraine. Mm -hmm. um, so last question on on um, Ukraine and Russia: Who blew up Nord Stream? <laughs> Again, it's it's a uh, it's something that I think the U.S. has been misleading us about. They said it was Russia uh, because if you know Russia didn't blow up Nord Stream, they, there would be arbitrages coming from European companies. They would have to pay fines for not delivering their gas. Some people say that it was actually the U.S. with the U.K. who blocked Nord Stream so that Europe would be dependent on U.S. gas. What are your thoughts on that? I don't speculate on something I don't know. It's meaningless to speculate on something I don't know. Mm -hmm. Well, with waste the information, of, it's a waste of it, no. I don't have enough information to make even to make a decision. Even an educated suggestion. There was some investigative journalism done on it um, mm -hmm. that suggested the United States did it with the help of Norway. And I think that's probably a pretty good, pretty yeah. good theory. I'm not 100% on it, but I, I, lean, I lean towards supporting that and thinking there was probably another, another party at play as well. All right. Uh, let's move on to China. So obviously the situation with Taiwan has been getting hotter and hotter. There's been increased tensions. So Mark, can you give us a bit of a historical background? On what is And why, why is China so sensitive about Taiwan, which is a small island with 25 million people? Because it considers Taiwan to be part of, of, of mainland China and because uh, under Nixon, uh, as part of the establishment of diplomatic relations between the United States and China, there was what's called the One China Policy that Kissinger and Nixon agreed to, which is that Taiwan is, no, we no longer have diplomatic relations with, with Taiwan. Uh, at the same time, we support their, indep their independence. It's a very murky diplomatic solution that's not really a solution. But I think in China's case, it probably has to do much more with the sense of Chinese importance and historical mission than it does um, um, any practical sense. Because if mm -hmm. they were to take over Taiwan, they would lose out as well because Taiwan is, as I mentioned earlier, a very, very important uh, industrial base for the most advanced, sophisticated chips that, that we produce and other electronics as well. So it's a functioning democracy. It's a rather exciting democracy. It's a place where uh, people who've been there, I, I have not been to Taiwan, I've been to mainland China, I've not been to Taiwan, tell me it's really a dynamic and exciting uh, Asian Uh, economy along with South Korea and mm -hmm. Japan, these are the, the mighty East Asian uh, economies. 
As you said, over 90% of advanced chips comes from Taiwan. Over 60% of semiconductors come from there. So we really do are highly dependent on that small island with 25 million people. Um, Angela, what is your opinion about us getting involved militarily with Taiwan? I think the first thing the United States needs to do is go through an aggressive deregulation phase so that if and when we do need to start manufacturing chips here, we can do that. It costs a lot more money to do that stuff over here, and we are we are behind the gun, which is why we buy so many things from China. Um, there was a U.S. Chips Act recently, yeah, which incentivized more more companies to come here, yeah, produce chips here. Let's keep let's keep doing it. Like it's not just tax breaks. I mean, regulatory frameworks mm -hmm. need to be slashed and burned. Um. The situation with Taiwan is really challenging, and I think that we should work really hard to try to find a diplomatic solution. I would not want to see yeah. what happened to Hong Kong happen to Taiwan. I also don't want to get the United States involved in a military conflict. I'd like to see, is there something else? And, and someone who is who's familiar with Chinese culture needs to be involved in these negotiations, you know. Donald Trump, Mr. Let's Make a Deal. You know. <laughs> okay, well, you know, maybe give it a try. Yeah. Sure, give it a shot. Everybody can give it a shot. But I think we should be sensitive to, to international business and how, how they do things. It doesn't always have to be done our way. Um, we should see, you know, like, what do they really want? Is it, is it that they want back everything that they view as theirs? Is it a technological element? Is there some other compromise that can be reached? I don't like to view these sort of things as zero-sum games because I think that's oversimplifying things and I think it's our duty to work harder. And and you know what? There might be concessions that the United States government could make about some of our bad policies with China and that alone might be enough to get them to back off and get mm -hmm. us another hundred years of, of you know, like peace where we're not freaking out and nervous. Um, I don't think we should be sending Nancy Pelosi over there either to, to rile them up. Like I think we should be trying to de-escalate. Mm -hmm. Mark, what does China want? Do they want all of Taiwan? Well, it's hard to tell whether they want it because there's probably different groups within China that have different views. I mean, if you want to build a wealthy uh, China, you're not going to want to wreck uh, Taiwan. You're not going to want to have a conflict with, um, with the West because that is your main market. Uh, without the West, China would would not be as wealthy as it is it's becoming because it's interdependency with, with, the, with the West. So I think reasonable voices in China are going to look at anything but a war because yeah. that's not going to do them any good. And they're looking at the Russia example and they're seeing Ukraine and saying, probably, I'm guessing, I have no idea, but I'm guessing they're saying we don't want anything resembling that uh, because that is not going to do us any good. I mean, I think, coming back to Russia for a second, I think, and it makes me feel very bad because I, I have spent my whole career dealing with that part of the world for close to 50 years. Uh, and I think it's tragic, tragic that uh, Russia's committing a type of political suicide. I leave the war in Ukraine alone, but just, just what they're doing in terms of new repressive laws, uh, these new weird uh, new constitutional amendments uh, in, in coding traditional values, basically pushing out their most talented youth. I think it's, it's horrendous. And I think China taking a look at, uh, at Russia is probably going to say we're going to play it very differently. By the way, I, I, sh I should say Russia has become kind of a vassal state of, of China because it's really they depend on China for yeah. everything. Uh, including whatever parts and economic issues. So they're subservient to China in a way that in the 1950s, China was subservient to the Soviet Union. Kind of flip those roles. I think, yeah, the strength of allies and the situation in Ukraine has sort of deterred China from well, they trying, see, they see the, the horrible consequences on so many different levels. Yeah. You know, and, and they think, realize that their military is significantly weaker than the U.S. military. The, the Russia's military? No, or, no, the Chinese oh, military. Chinese. Oh, I, I don't know. I guess, I guess that would be one lesson to draw. I think sooner on the economic level, the lesson to draw is uh, 
don't don't upset the apple cart. If things are working well, why do you want to? Uh, uh, you know, Russia and, and Ukraine could have continued to coexist in a in a peaceful environment uh, perfectly well for for years to come. China has the largest standing army in the world, and their navy is in better shape than the United States Navy is. is it? Yes, it is. Um, their freight carriers and their large like, aircraft carriers mm-hmm. are in better in better shape than we are. But um, and uh, they they view their as they say a strategic partnership with with Russia as something that's still developing. They don't because of that ugly history. They don't really like to call them allies, but strategic right. partnership. But the more we dig in with the Ukraine Russia conflict, it looks like the more there are some other countries that are starting to get a little bit cozier with each other, like I like Iran, like China, like Russia, and so it's interesting we're seeing sort of like you know. I don't like to use Nazi comparisons because I think it's really hyperbolic, yeah. you know, but like access and allies stuff, you're starting to see other other global superpowers come together and join forces. I think we should probably be mindful of, of that and not create, you know, superpower uh, enemies. I don't think that's a wise thing for the United States um, government to do. Russia has been shopping around trying to get military support, especially from China. Yep. And China hasn't done anything right now militarily to support Russia. They talked about giving them, there was, I can't remember exactly what it was, but I read it just a couple of weeks ago. Mm-hmm. They talked about sending them some small amount of artillery, I believe. And I don't know that they committed to it, but there mm-hmm. were just, there were talks. Well, I think if they were to commit to it, the U.S. would retaliate through sanctions which they have clearly signaled that that's what they would do if China was to support Russia militarily. Is Could that you, a good strategy? No. Can you imagine full-on economic warfare between the United oh. States and China? No more Happy Meal toys. I mean, half of the things we own. <laughs> do you, I mean, think about uh, during the worst lockdowns when there were supply chain crises and you had all these barges floating out in Long Beach. I lived not too far away you had all these ships just floating just stuck out there because they couldn't get all their goods off you thought that was bad people were annoyed that their amazon packages were like a week late it would be much much worse than that imagine what percentage of what you buy from amazon comes from china but there's also codependency yeah there's a strong codependency that china understands (laughs) and its salaries and its money and its well-being and the new cities they're building is dependent upon the fact that that west is is buying these things so they can't do without that as well. They need the customer very much to be able to continue their growth. And it, and it is a remarkable development in China's astounding uh, when it took a very different direction in the 1980s. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, would China's- point out in terms of mil- military alliances, look at this very curious alliance between Russia and Iran, which you know you would think would not yeah. be a likely one, but there it is. And, and there's mutual support, or Russia and Syria, you know, another rather, uh, shall we say, um, rather dictatorial country as well that they have teamed up with. So there have been these alliances that have been forming over the last couple of years. So what can the United States do to prevent these alliances between I China and Russia? I would say very little. <laughs> Uh, It can prevent alliances, and I don't think that's the policy of the U.S. to prevent or not prevent alliances. I think what what we ought to be doing, to the extent we can, is obviously working with our allies, having a strong relationship with our allies, having a strong relationship with... um, you know, the countries that, that with we, which we can trade and with which we have common values. I think that's a very important one. I would raise a question, maybe you would like to discuss it as well, as I think in many ways our policy, if I'm to blame U.S. policy, and, and I don't want, I want to come across as someone who thinks everything the U.S. does is perfect, it's not, I would say one of the mistakes that we made as a country was this notion and it's a very deeply developed American notion that if we trade and if a country develops a market economy, somehow miraculously they're going to become a democracy and somehow miraculously they're going to become a free society. And if you look at China's rise, we are the co, we meaning the West, maybe collective West, the United States in particular, 
are the means by which they became wealthy and developed the largest army and are developing nuclear weapons and are doing this. I mean, we are the, because beginning, I would say as early as the senior Bush administration, mm -hmm. accelerating under uh, President Clinton and continuing on in every uh, administration, whether Democratic or Republican, this notion, and I remember reading about it over the years, when Chinese, the average Chinese starts earning above X thousand dollars a mm -hmm. month, somehow democracy will be inevitable. Democracy is going to come, freedom, they're gonna demand a, a, a role. And that's not the case. Cultures matter and cultures are different. And I don't, not an expert on China, I don't wanna draw deep historical uh, analysis of China, yeah. but clearly the culture of China does not necessarily lend itself. It may, but it doesn't have to lend itself to being an open European Western uh, country. And so I think where we made the mistake, and we in a certain sense made it with Russia as well, we thought that by investing, by building, by developing, somehow that in and of itself would bring about a friendly democratic country. And it doesn't. True. Yeah, I think culture plays an important role. But a lot of Chinese people feel free. So oh, sure, freer than they were before 1980, of course. I mean, uh, but there's surveillance, there is government intrusion in every, there's internet that is censored. There, I mean, there are restrictions that I would say 99% of Americans would not want to have. Yeah. Uh, and I'll tell you that for a long time, when I was living in Russia, Russia was freer than China. Russia had no restrictions on the internet. Very mm -hmm. rarely would I... In the Soviet Union? I'm talking about Russia, 2012, oh, you mean, oh, Russia, 2012 okay. right, right, 2013, no, okay. when I lived there. I mean, very rarely would a site be closed. And that's changed now. That's yeah. changed a lot in the last five years. But China has had such restrictions that, that you can't visit these sites, you can't do this, your emails are read, your, your picture is taken a thousand times on the street, and you're surveilled on every street. So... It is, it is a, a, a country that's very antithetical to, to the, sort of the liberal, open, democratic West. Angela? China has a different idea of freedom than Chinese people. They can smoke in restaurants. Yeah. You know, they, can, they could get up and dance on a table, stand up, you know, do something that we here in the United yeah. States view as inappropriate. And that's their idea of freedom. They don't necessarily all understand what it's like to live outside of a surveillance state or to have free speech. So these concepts are, are pretty foreign and alien to a lot of those people. Not everyone, people, people whose families, you know, escaped and fled before the Cultural Revolution, they still have that knowledge, mm -hmm. they still understand, but a lot of people over there, they just, very different idea, very different concept of freedom. Um, and which really reminds me, you know, we should safeguard our freedoms and, yeah. and cherish them and not let them erode. I, I don't ever want to turn into China. Me neither. And a lot of people in the West are excited about the social surveillance, uh, social credit system. Yep. They sure are. Right? Pretty Scan gross. Scan your face and, and you can pay for your Coke, right? That's, uh, it could go bad pretty quickly. Um, so next presidential elections in Taiwan are next year, 2024. And I've heard that China is trying to have a huge influence there. That's how they want to overtake Taiwan through yeah. these elections. They want to elect the pro-Chinese right. president, overthrow democracy, right. dismantle it from the inside. They don't want any military conflict. So what, what are your thoughts about it? Do you think that they will succeed? What can we do to prevent them from doing that? I don't think they'd succeed, but I think, man, if we could just get them to just play on those terms, it would be so much safer, you know, I mean, because no one here believes in election meddling, right? That doesn't exist. So then we're <laughs> going to abide by the terms and then no one's going to be upset. Um, I would much rather see them resolve their conflict through voting than, than through guns and, and a coup. Well, my limited knowledge of, of, of Taiwan, and I preface that I, I'm not in any way an expert on it, my sense is it's a vibrant civil society. They have a dynamic president currently, and that in a free election, my sense would be that that, that would prevail. But, but that's a rather, shall we say, 
yeah. not a professional opinion. It's not something I, I study or look at polling data or anything of that nature. Do you but think I agree with the, the principle of, of, of elections as a democratic process. I'm very pleased to see that Turkey, which I was very concerned was going a yeah. dictatorial direction, Erdogan showing similarities with Putin and, and Orban and others. Nonetheless, Turkey has sufficiently a vibrant civil society where an opposition candidate could gain enough votes to have a runoff, and I think that's a sign that Turkey is a lot healthier politically. And I, since it's a very important country in that part of the world, I was very, very pleased to see the recent results that, that suggest that whoever wins, and Erdogan may end up winning the runoff, it still shows a vibrant, strong, engaged society. But don't you think that this runoff is a uh, more of a show that the er Erdogan has put off to, you know, show people that, or, or to like fake that there is democracy but there isn't? Because if he wins the runoff, you know, he's still in power. I don't know. I, I have no reason to 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 agree with you on that. I haven't studied the issue, but it doesn't make yeah. any, any reason. I my experience of Turkey, and I've been there plenty of times, is that there is certainly in the cities a very, very, um, I would say, westernized, modern Turkey. That doesn't extend to the countryside, but the, but the cities are very much, and they see themselves as European, they want to be yeah. European, uh, they are members of NATO, uh, and uh, it's, it's uh, and I think, I see no reason why that part of the population would not have voted that way. There's, it doesn't strike me as being peculiar. Now, whether they are a majority, I, I can't say. But the fact that they do exist, they are there, and they're very dynamic is, is, a, is just a fact. Mm -hmm. Let's workshop this idea. I think that when it comes to people's quality of life and their happiness with our government, it's not always about democracy. I think it's about free market capitalism and adopting as close as you can some sort of system of free markets so that people can pull themselves out of poverty and live comfortably. And I think that's what we've seen happen in China. They have adopted as close of a framework to free market capitalism as their communist government will allow. People are still under, you know, under, under iron communist rule but they're happier and maybe more complacent with that mm -hmm. because they're more comfortable in their day-to-day -day lives. And I think that that's not the only country where you see that happening. Um, and so maybe the key to sharing and spreading Western values is not trying to quote unquote export democracy like we did in the Iraq war, but it's through free trade and really good trade agreements not exclusive trade agreements, very open trade agreements, fostering good relationships economically so mm -hmm. that people see us and they want to be like us. So serve as a role model to other countries that free yeah. market leads to more prosperity. Yep. And that's what you should do. My question is, do leaders of autocratic countries actually care about the prosperity of their people? Sometimes they do. Like Some, not all. Sometimes they do. When it benefits them. Yeah. If if things are unstable, no one wants a civil war. No one wants a civil yeah. war. And so if you can substitute free market capitalism for democracy, sometimes I think that's a good compromise. You know, people have a happier, qu better quality of life day to day. Still got stuck with a dictatorial ruler. He's still there, but at least he's not trying to kill and gas his own people. Yeah. What do you think, Mark? Well, I think that free markets have been in many ways, the miracle of uh, post-Soviet uh, reality in, in Eastern Europe. I mean, uh, let's take Poland, for example. Uh, I first went to Poland in 1981 during Solidarity, and I can assure you that Poland in 1981 was one poor, poor country with very few goods, um, very shabby conditions, um, very unhappy people. Uh, under communist rule, I think that post-1989, Poland has become a fully thriving, fairly wealthy European country that is an astounding miracle. 
to look at from 1981 to today, I, I think you would, it's, it's literally a miracle the extent yeah. to which the, the market economy in Poland has provided a dynamic, dynamic growth to the country and, and, and to, the, to the whole region. Same thing is true of the Baltic states. I mean, you've got three small former Soviet republics that are among the highest per capita incomes in the world. They mm -hmm. have embraced uh, the market economy with great zeal and, and great talent. So I think these factors are very important and, and in many ways um, the market economy has proved itself to be very successful in, in a lot of these post-Soviet states. For a while, for a while it was gaining ground in Russia that has been reversed. Most of Russia is now back to state ownership of most large yeah. enterprises. Uh, you've had a re-socialization of the economy under Putin the last five, six, seven years. Uh, those who had more entrepreneurial interests and skills have left. And so you, you have this kind of, it's not communism, but it's a state capitalism, which is very different from free market capitalism. So why is he doing it? Why does he not realize that free markets are what leads to prosperity? Well, I think in the case of, of Russia, it has a lot to do with culture and historical mm. experience. I mean, with the exception of a few years here and there, the entire history of a country has been state-run. It's state enterprise, state yeah. industry, state control. And that's the default. So when things aren't seemingly go well, and it also, and this is maybe the most important, when you control capital, you you don't have any real opposition. You can't have politics, you can't have independent voices because you basically fundamentally own the economy. Yeah. Now, owning the economy has its own dangers, but owning the economy also squashes any kind of strong political force coming and challenging you. So I think there is that. It's easier to be a dictator without free markets. It's, it's yeah. very yeah. hard dictator to be with. a dictator with a market economy. As a matter of yeah. fact, I would argue that it's virtually impossible to be a full dictator if you have a thriving market economy. Because a market economy is your, mm -hmm. is your uh, counterweight to, to a dictatorship. So that makes China kind of a curious case because oh, yeah. you do have private enterprise, you do have wealthy people, but you've got the government. And so I think maybe the recent policies by Xi that are more dictatorial and, and clamping down on, on private enterprise may very well have a political basis to it rather than economic. I think... Um Let's see if I can, I can't remember any exact quotes, but Vladimir Putin has made some comments mm -hmm. in some of his speeches lately, really condemning what he views as like degeneracy and decay of the West. Like that. In, uh, in what way? What oh, sense? moral, 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 like absolute degradation from his perspective. And I think that he probably views that as part of the existential threat to Russia and at this point the bad outweighs the good with us you know like culturally he thinks we suck we're not good all kinds of terrible things we hate family you know we we we're, we're not christian anymore we hate god yeah. we hate baby jesus the whole thing it's really sad um and so he's tossing out the good stuff too you know and that's that's really unfortunate cuz i feel like, you know like that's the stuff that keeps people okay in Russia, I mean, there's still there's still probably, and I'm sure Mark could talk about this more. You know, some ugly remnants of Soviet culture, people yeah. being unhappy over there. Um, Michael Malice's book, The White Pill, does a really good job of of taking that, that apart. You have awesome. it's really incredible. It's talk, yeah, I, I have some some friends who grew up in Soviet Russia who are over here. They talk about like getting cereal, you know, like how exciting it was to get breakfast cereal. It's like blows my mind. So I would hope that Putin doesn't go back to Soviet policy. It seems a little bit more like a fascist uh, consolidation of power during a military emergency, but I know it's been creeping in. You know, it's it's happened before that too, but mm -hmm. it doesn't look good. The good thing about Eastern Europe is that a lot of people there experienced communism. Yep. And so they don't take democracy and free markets for granted. Yep. They appreciate the, you know, the goods and services that are there because of capitalism. Yep. 
And I think in America, because Americans never experienced communism, never experienced the absence of free markets, they don't realize what could happen if you know we had socialism. I have no idea. They have no they idea. Have, yeah, they can't even imagine it. I mean, I get I get annoyed. You know, with, with Joe Biden and Democrats, and I'll call everything communism. But but the but the reality yeah. is, like, it's real communism. Uh, we're not we're not anywhere close to it. We're not anywhere close to it. That's that's just like a slur coming yeah. out of my mouth. We're not throwing people in gulags and having them disappeared. And there's no breakfast cereal on the aisle. <laughs> yeah. Um, Mark- not only that, but we have something that I I hope we continue to preserve, and that is something that is called the rule of law, mm. with courts and your right to defend yourself, your right to, to, to representation, your right to, you know, it can be abused, as all things can be abused, but basically what really strikes you when you travel to other parts of the world you, yeah. is the vulnerability of the individual, how little freedom rights you have in a police state. And and I think we, I was born here, I I lived overseas, but I mean, this is my country, and I take for granted the fact that I have the freedom of speech, I have uh, rights uh, vis-a-vis, you know, if anybody, if I were to be stopped by a policeman, I have all these rights that I know I have and I could exercise as I need. That is not true for a big, big part of the world. Yeah. And I would hope that more Americans travel and see the world so they can come to appreciate what it is we need to preserve. And I think that is a very, very big part of, of what makes the U.S. what it is. And, and there are, as you say, things that we need to protect and, 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 and honor. I mean, these, are, these are amazing achievements. I agree. I agree. So in terms of markets, there has been some suggestions of complete decoupling from China. I think Vivek Ramaswamy, who is a presidential candidate, Republican, has suggested that we need to completely dismantle all relationships with China, no trading, no no markets, nothing like that. What, What do you think about it? That's completely insane. Why do we want to isolate one of the other world's superpowers? Why do we want economic warfare with another powerful country. That doesn't, who does that? Uh, okay, the Chinese government sucks. Like they're they're bad people. They're very rotten. Maybe some of them are morally reprobate. They're going to hell. There's nothing we can do. <laughs> that, what about all the other millions of people involved in this like, you know, transaction? Maybe billions. Uh, that That's totally absurd. Like, I would totally agree. Uh, I think that the, the key is to have a dialogue whether you agree or not agree with everybody. I mean, that's a very, very important part. And I think one of the things that, um, that the Cold War was, and there were a lot of smart things that we all did during the Cold War, is that no matter what the situation was, beginning in 1947, beginning of Cold War 1947, ending in 1991, is there was always, on many different levels, communication. There were cultural mm-hmm. exchanges, there were educational exchanges, Uh, There were competitions, there were uh, negotiations, there was a whole set of ways in which we had what was called the Cold War regime that kept the peace. I mean, let's face it, despite conflicts here and there, the peace was fundamentally kept because it was a well thought through on both sides, we need to have relationships. The last thing you want to do is not to have a relationship with the biggest country in the world, i.e. China. I mean, that would be absurd. And you want to have that relationship on different levels. Yes, there is a trade relationship. Try to make it fair. Don't try to be taken advantage of. But then there are cultural spheres. There are educational spheres. There is youth coming up in both countries that should be meeting and interacting. And and I'm a big fan of, of the Fulbright types of exchanges that we've had for 60 plus years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think they, they tend to lessen conflict they tend to bring people together people realize that there are decent and wonderful human beings all over the world so I I think something of that nature is just simply absurd I mean I don't know what else to say could you imagine how many small businesses I it would it was more like imagine how many small businesses would be able to survive because it would kill the vast majority I don't know three percent ten percent fifteen percent some it would be a very small amount of people who made it out 
cons- it would be an absolute consolidation of state power because it would become an economic crisis and the government would have to step in and and try to piece things together. It'd probably be a global level disaster. I agree. I agree. I don't I don't think it's uh realizable at all. Yeah. Um and Mark, you mentioned diplomacy, which made me think about the recent prisoner swap between Russia and the US. Like is that is would Russia you consider and the US? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Like, prisoner what? swap. I think the basketball player Brittany Griner. Brittany Griner. That's Russia, you mean? Hmm? Russia. Right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh like is that diplomacy? Would you would you consider this step part of United States uh effort to establish better relations with the US? And what else could we do? Like the, the, those small actions I did. Really, you know. Yeah. Well, they traded a uh a convicted criminal for a innocent basketball player. I mean, it's it's not a very fair trade. I'm happy that she was released from prison. I think it's outrageous that she was ever arrested and, and put yeah. in prison. But the trade was not fair. I mean, it's not a. It, I wouldn't equate Brittany Griner with with a uh, a drug dealer and an arms dealer. Uh, but I think that what worries me, and, and it worried me back in the 70s and 80s when I traveled to the Soviet Union, although there was it was a gentler place than it is today, curiously, is that uh, they will take, uh, like for example, Evan. Gershkovich of the Wall Street Journal is most probably a, um, a hostage, I mean, taken in order to be traded for someone that they have in mind, whoever that may be. Uh, and I think that, that gets us into a, into a tit-for-tat situation that reminds me of the Cold War, and in some ways is, is even worse than the Cold War, because I think the last time a journalist was grabbed was in 1986, if I'm mm-hmm. not mistaken. Um, and, um, And now we're back in that kind of situation, which is which is very unfortunate. And I feel very bad for. I've never been in a Soviet prison. I've never been close to a Soviet prison, but I know a lot of people who have, and so I've heard many, many stories about what it's like. It's it is it's a horrendous experience, and I I feel bad for for him and for anyone else who, yeah. who has to go through it. Yeah. I mean, there's a brutality. I don't know how to how to put it, but there is a a brutality, unfortunately might be post-Soviet uh, life that is palpable in, in Russia today. It's a, it's, a, it's a rough, rough country uh, with a, a high crime rate, but, but also a high crime rate from the point of view of the authorities. You know, the authorities are part high of High corruption. Pro- yeah, corruption yeah. and just a, a, a brutality that, that is, um, you know, those prisons are going to be, I'm not saying that U.S. prisons are a fun place to go. Yeah. I wouldn't say that either, but the, these are really rough places. And I'm actually looking forward to uh, B- Brittany Grinder's memoirs as to what her experience was. As a, I'm sure as she a, wasn't treated as bad as a Russian national. Uh, probably not because she is... Uh, foreigners in general are a little bit better off than, than the yes. natives. But then she's also a, a, a big star. And I think she had a popular following in Russia, actually, as a basketball star. Oh. So. But it'll still be interesting to see her memoirs. I think they will reveal something on a personal level that we can't get from other sources. I think so. Blows my mind to, to consider that anybody outside of the United States would have heard of the WNBA. <laughs> WNBA? Yeah, the women's the American women's the women's national, basketball okay. league. But if yeah. that's what kept her alive and safe, you know, like I'm I'm glad. But she played for the Russian Women's Basketball League that is the equivalent. And so she was on the Ekaterinburg team and got paid far more playing in Russia than she got paid in the United States. And that's the reason why she was in Russia. That's why she, she was, was there, a yeah. A highly paid uh, basketball star oh. on an otherwise uh, you know, Russian international team. So weird. It's just like not my world. Imagine like Ronaldo who was in Saudi Arabia <laughs> right. going to prison. That's 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 crazy. Um so talking about corruption, how much of the foreign aid that we're giving to Ukraine is subjected to corruption, you think? Because uh, Ukraine is known as a highly corrupt country. Yeah. Um so what 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 kind of job is Zelensky doing to stop it? You know, I wouldn't even be nowhere to 
I, mean, I have no data, so without data, my guess is, is, is a guess. I have, I have no, I, I assume, I mean, just because one knows human nature in general, whether it's COVID relief or whether it's aid or whatever, certain percentage of things get, get uh, stolen or misdirected and so forth. But I think that that, um, I would assume, uh, would, but I have no data. So I, I can't tell yeah. you something I have no data on. It's a meaningless comment on my part yeah. uh, to, to comment on something I don't know. So Whitney Webb uh, is an investigative journalist, and her, her estimate mm -hmm. is that 70% of it gets what? tossed out. 70%. You know, I have misused. no idea who she is, and I have no reason to believe her. So I, 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 would, we, uh, I would... Sure. That's, that's what I got. That's... That's the that's the data. I don't know. I'm not over there. I can't, you know, I can't verify it for myself. I can trust her work and dig through and look at her resources and verify what you can. But that's um, that's what I've got. Yeah, it's pretty ugly. And I don't think that that would be. Um, I'm not even going to blame Ukraine for that. That seems to be the way that it goes. Generally speaking, when America engages in foreign aid, we take money from poor people and give it to rich people in other countries. We rob from our taxpayers, and then you know, thieves and uh, corrupt governments end up taking what we have passed out, which is really tragic. But something I mean, to look be aware of. Israel. Israel yeah. is a prime example of, you know, the U.S. foreign aid subject. I think we give what four billion to Israel each year, and which Egypt, and Egypt. is used to purchase U.S goods yep. and services, yes, yep. guns and military equipment. And uh, the reason why we give it to them is because we want control over Middle Eastern affairs. Yep. We have school lunch yeah. debt here. Like I'm not I'm not going to advocate for socialism. School lunch debt? School lunch debt. I'm not I'm not saying that we should all pay for yeah, I'm not an, I'm not advocating for socialism as a libertarian, but I'm just saying for perspective, we have yeah. school lunch debt public school children who are in debt and their parents are in debt because they cannot afford the macaroni and cheese and milk that comes on the plastic tray at school every day. Just perspective on where we should be sending money if we got to send it anywhere. That's ridiculous. Mark, what is, what is your opinion on foreign aid? Is it net positive, net negative, it generally? It depends on what side. I mean, there's so, there's so many different examples of foreign aid that I would not judge them as one group, I would separate them out. I think that there is, for example, I mean, you could call it foreign aid, although I think it, one could also call it international diplomacy, mm -hmm. but there's a whole range of foreign aid that goes into um, what I would call, broadly speaking, educational and cultural affairs. There's an Educational and Cultural Affairs Bureau of the State Department, it used to be USAIA, United States Information Agency, which I think in its overall totality is by a very small part. I mean, these are cheap programs. Uh, we're not talking about billions, we're talking about. I'll give you just one example that all of our broadcasting of Radio Free Europe, Voice of America Today, Radio Free Asia, is less than one third of the budget of the University of Texas in Austin. Um, it's under one billion. Wow. For everything, beginning, every engineer, every salary, everything. It's about 800 million. Mm -hmm. Which in Washington is a is a you know, tiny. It's tiny. less. The, it's a rounding off sort of number. But anyway, I'm I'm not. I'm saying every, every program should have legitimacy. I'm not saying that you should just give money for for no reason. But I think that one should separate foreign aid into very different categories, because they are very different. So you have foreign aid that could be hunger relief in case of famine, in case of tragedy, in case of a tsunami hitting. There's that pocket of foreign aid, there's foreign aid that, that is in the area of cultural and educational diplomacy. There is military foreign aid, which is a whole other category. And you could be mm -hmm. against military foreign aid, but before educational and cultural foreign aid. I mean, you have to separate out what aspect mm -hmm. you think makes the most amount of sense for what I would argue, yeah. and argue very strongly, that we're in a globalized, integrated world. So you need allies, you need understanding, you need the world to... to deal with and interact with the United States and the West. And, and we have a, a lot of competition. We haven't talked about China's foreign policy, China's uh, attempt to control Africa or Latin America. It's a very big part of Chinese foreign policy. They are, speaking of meddling, they're meddling all over 
uh, Africa, all over Asia, all over. Well, Latin China America. owns Africa. I yeah, would even dare to well, say. Well, not entirely, but it certainly wants to own it. So I think we we have to be engaged in some way. Now, whether there is intelligent foreign aid or or wasteful, that's that's a whole different set of, of criteria that I would look at and try to eliminate those things that are that are clearly a boondoggle of some sort, some deal that's made from things that, that have legitimacy mm -hmm. and, um, and worth. I agree. I think the answer to helping other countries is free markets, not foreign aid. I love it. I love, I love it. I mean, if we didn't have a giant deficit, maybe I'd be more open to talking about foreign aid, but we're so in debt and it just grows every year. I want I want prosperity. I want it for other countries, but I want it for us too. I agree. So, um, to look at general U.S. foreign policy, what do you think we're not paying enough attention to? There's been a lot of talk about Ukraine, Russia, mm -hmm. China. What are we missing? Is there anything that we should be paying more attention to? It's kind of slipping through. I would say I would begin by saying, educating Americans about the world. It's a, unfortunately, the United States is a rather provincial country in terms of understanding not just what the other countries are, which mm -hmm. is very good in its own right, but understanding the role the U.S. is perceived to be playing everywhere and the interest that the rest of the world has in the United States. And our position, the fact that any U.S. story is front page news all over the world uh, is, is something that, that I hope that more Americans would understand how we deal with our problems when we come across as absolute idiots. We not only undercut ourselves, but we undercut the whole concept of a free and open market economy and a free and open society. That, uh, that, that foreign policy is much more than a particular action in this part of the country. It's much more integrating and understanding what what the world is about. So I would approach it in a more domestic fashion. I don't mm -hmm. think there is enough um, presentation of foreign, of foreign cultures in general, foreign languages. We are among the worst in the world in terms of knowing anything about the rest of the world. Very low level and very low, little interest really in learning um, foreign languages. So I would approach it in a somewhat different way, I think. More social, more more domestic, less mm -hmm. just looking at, at policy of a particular government. I think world history is not even taught in schools. It's only American history. That's isn't it? what I was gonna say. Is history? We have a lot of conflicts right now, and yeah. I mean, I am no, I am no fan of public schools. I wish they were all gone. Government schools, to clarify, but um. We really do need to teach people world history so that they can understand what happened in Soviet Russia, so that they can understand what the Cultural Revolution was, yeah. so that people aren't wearing Che Guevara t-shirts because they think it's cool and trendy, that, that they, they understand that Che Guevara murdered gay people yeah. and did a bunch of horrendous things. Like I think, I think education on world history would be really, really helpful, and, and a little more education about our strange, strange relationships with Saudi Arabia and Iran as well. And I would also mention uh, we have to start paying attention to illegal immigration. Um, on the southern border here in Texas, mm -hmm. there's 10,000 people that cross the border every day. Illegal I, immigrants. Uh, yeah. I would love for us to also talk about, that's more recent history, why the economies of Central and South American countries are so messed up. The United States was me meddling in Peruvian elections just a few months ago. Um, why? 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 That's a really good question. That's a really good question. I wish I could like fully articulate what was going on. Their, their, their country's leader was locked in prison, and we were down there to help them elect a, a new person. It seems like we do that, and then, uh, you know... We're doing too much. A few, we're doing too much. We just need to take some time off. It seems like every time we do it, you know, then there's a crisis on the border a few years afterwards. Maybe we should leave everyone alone, and then they won't rush our border like that. That's a good point. Um, last point, I recently read a book about lying. It's called Why Leaders Lie by John Mershmeyer. And so I, I, I was curious to hear your thoughts about 
strate- strategic lying, right? Like politicians always lie, especially before getting us into a war. Yes. Right? You had World War One, Woodrow Wilson lied. Yep. You had World War Two, FD, FDR lied about the Greer incident in 1941. You had uh, LBJ who lied about an incident to get us into the Vietnam War. You had Bush who lied about Iraq. Why do leaders lie? Like, what, what what's what's going on? Is it is it a good strategy? Is it, like, is it is it necessary? Is it bad? Is lying always bad? Like Kennedy, for example, lied about the deal with the Soviet Union to de-escalate uh, the nuclear tensions. Do you think it was a good lie? Do you think that if he told the truth, the public would have been able to handle it? I want to do like a whole hour and a half on <laughs> this topic. Yeah. But I mean, generally, people people who are in positions of power are incentivized to hold on to those positions of power. And one of the things you can do is hide the truth. And then you also inherit a whole bunch of ugly stuff and other people's lies, and you have to keep covering for that. I think, you know, I want to make it really like, you know, simple and clear cut and say like, everybody's just like wrong when they lie. But I think we have no idea how incredibly complex and ugly things are when you get to that top level of government. I agree. I don't know. I would again differentiate all those examples rather than combine them into one because mm-hmm. I think each situation calls for its own nuanced an- analysis. Um, and sometimes you are caught in the throes of an of a action. Sometimes the, they are genuinely not knowing, not purposefully lying, but lying in, in because one does not know, one says ends up telling the truth i um i happen to have met only once in my life colin powell who was the secretary of state who um, famously got up in the u.n and talked about the weapons of mass destruction that uh, saddam hussein had realizing later that he had been misled and and lamented that very much personally and and uh, was horrified by it and i and i take him at his word that he did not want to do that and he felt he was very much misled I think there's, in any complicated situation, whether it's business or government, there's lots of unknown contingencies and people make assumptions, sometimes incorrectly, uh, without um, necessarily aiming to or trying to, to, to mislead, but end up misleading through a lack of full information, through a dis- decision to act before you have all your information gathered, I mean, I take a, 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 a much more, I would say, view of any organization, whether it's a big corporation, whether it's the government or whatever, that these are complicated, large, complex organizations dealing with innumerable unknowns at any one time. And how you negotiate how you, those unknown currents, we tend to remember the mistakes, we tend to forget the successes. True. And so there is a skewed, I mean, if you're going to begin by saying all the people who lied, you're going to pick out all the cherry, you're going to cherry pick all the examples that prove your point. If you want to flip that around and say, here are all the policies that were successful, you can cherry pick uh, the successful. And in, in both cases, you've made nothing very sophisticated yeah. from your analysis. All you've done is you can cherry pick what you want to cherry pick. Well, you can do that in any situation. You can write a, a book saying that, Amazon is terrible or Microsoft is terrible. You can flip and say Amazon is wonderful and Apple. I mean, it depends on what you want to prove. So I'm very sus- sus- mm-hmm. suspicious, let's say, of anything that's out to prove some big truth about about it. The government is is people, and you know, people are people. They some people try to do their best. Some people fail at doing their best. Uh, but overall, overall, most people. Luckily, I would say in the United States, not elsewhere, try to do their best, whether it's a, at a local level or whether it's a federal level. So they lie in the national interest, not for selfish reasons, mostly. Well, it depends on, on, again, it depends on how you define that lie. It, it could be a honest uh, mistake. It could be thinking that you're telling the truth, but in actual fact, it's not. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that uh, there are factors that, that may outweigh 
uh, a, an influence a decision and you try to explain it the best you can, it comes off very poorly done. I mentioned earlier, I think the Iraq war was a, was a serious mistake. I remember when it happened, I had this gut feeling in my body that this was a horrible thing for, for the US to, to begin. Mm -hmm. I intuitively felt it was gonna be bad. So these, I fully agree with it, that was, that was a mistake, but I think I can say that, and I think it will be proven over and over again, the absolute superb uh, way in which the U.S. handled the disintegration of the Soviet Union, I think in retrospect is one of those momentous moments where I can sit back and say, my God, did the U.S. get it right? Uh, and they did it right in so many ways. And so I think it depends on, on the situation you pick. As mm -hmm. I said, you can cherry pick these things as you, as you wish. True, true. Cool. So, um, yeah, I mean, one interesting fact from the book was that Leaders are more likely to lie to their own public than to other leaders, right? Yeah. Because of the level of trust. The yep. public is more likely to trust the government than other leaders trusting each other. So there is there is less interstate lying and more lying to the public, more fear mongering. They're more likely to deceive the people who trust them. Yeah. You know, oh well I can I can pull the wool over I can kind of screw them over, they'll forgive me. Yeah. But these other guys they won't because we don't have skin in the game the same way. Yeah. That's a good point. Point. Well, cool. Uh, it was a great discussion. I think I learned a lot from you both. And even though we disagreed on some things, we agree that education yeah. needs to improve in the US. We need to incentivize more kids to learn about the world history. And uh, we need to focus our US foreign policy so that we don't get too distracted by imposing democracy in the world. and you know, while China is rising up. So thank you both. And uh, it was a pleasure speaking with you. Thanks for having me.